most people associate with the word Byzantine. Unfortunately, we seem to correlate it with corruption and ossified bureaucracy and out-of-date administration, lack of transparency, mostly negative pejorative connotations. And if we think about it, Byzantine in the religious sense of orthodoxy, we have this image of strange priests that marry, they have bushy beards, they wear black, they have odd rituals, very different than the more familiar Western Roman church. Where do we get these pejorative images of Byzantine, Byzantium, Byzantine Empire? Well, they go back all the way to the sixth century when the court historian Procopius wrote a Greek history of the Byzantine Empire from mostly the sixth century AD, and he also wrote a secret history, the lurid tales of the Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora. That was a major source for perhaps the greatest living classical historian of the 18th century was Edward Gibbon. And remember, his decline and fall of the Roman Empire did not stop in the fifth century AD, but it continued all the way into the 15th century with the Eastern Empire. So we have a prejudiced view of Byzantium, but we shouldn't. And I'd like to take you on a little tour of the history of Byzantium and try to appreciate what it did for Western culture in general. The first thing to remember is that the word Byzantium was a Greek word. It was a Greek city-state perched on that critical trisection of the Black Sea, the Bosphorus, and what the Greeks called the Hellespont, that long strait of water that connects the Aegean Sea with the Black Sea. So it was strategically located, but it was more or less of a backwater. Until the fourth century AD, the Emperor Constantine decided to re-establish a city on top of Byzantium, so to speak. Remember two generations earlier, the Emperor Diocletian had said that the empire is too unwieldy, it's too big, it's bifurcating between Roman speakers and the West and Eastern speakers in the East. So for administrative purposes, we're going to have two capitals, one in Rome and one uh, to the East. And then Constantine in 330, Constantine the Great, who we associate with accepting Christianity as the official religion of the entire Roman Empire, he established a, a magnificent city called the city, the polis of Constantine, Constantinople. And he laid it out quite magnificently, and it provided a key trade route between goods coming out of uh, the Black Sea and coming in through the Mediterranean. It was a watch post, so to speak, on the Danube, and uh, it symbolized or reified the fact that the Eastern Empire had become more wealthy. Then a strange thing happened. In the late 400s, 476 is the critical date that historians focus upon, Roman civilization in the West fell due to a series of invasions by Vandals, Viscos, Othgos, earlier Huns. And with that fall, the Eastern Empire did not disintegrate. Now, what do we mean by the Eastern Empire? Well, that was the area of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, the Holy Land, all the way down to what is now Sinai, and we'd go, we would go into Egypt as well, and then parts all the way eastward to Tigris and Euphrates, modern Greece, parts of Bulgaria, and even Albania. That was intact. Now, why did the West fall and the East didn't? The Eastern elements of the empire had become wealthier, wealthier in the sense that they were tied in with the Black Sea and the trade routes from India and China. The second thing to remember is that the East was more defensible. The Roman navy was never really distinguished in the West. In the East, it was a different story. The Chersonesus, that peninsula that leads into Constantinople, the Hellas Point, the body of water, was a natural barrier, as was the Bosphorus and the Black Sea. And the Byzantines, the Eastern Romans, so to speak, created a magnificent navy. The second that was able to defend from barbarian invasions much uh, more effectively than in the West. But more importantly, barbarian Slavic Germanic peoples, the Huns, for example, or the Bulgars, were never as numerous and they were never as restless as was true of uh, Germanic tribes and Goths and Vandals uh, in what is today Poland, East Germany, the former East Germany, and now Western Europe, France, Switzerland. So there was never the pressure that faced the West. And the result of that was that from 476 on, uh, 
Eastern Roman civilization survived under what we call Byzant Byzantium, Byzantine civilization. And not only survived, but less than a century after the fall of the West, in the 530s AD, the great emperor Justinian, the sole emperor now of Rome, did a number of amazing things under the guidance of his brilliant General Belisarius, he began to recapture parts of the fallen West. So successfully was he that by the mid 540s AD, all of North Africa was retaken from the Vandals, all the way from Egypt to what is now Morocco and Tunisia, parts of Spain, Sicily, Italy. And after a 20 year knockdown, drag out fight, most of Italy was now Byzantine. And for all practical purposes, except for Gaul, in northern Spain, you could make the argument that Rome was intact again, but this time under the auspices of an Eastern Roman Empire that was largely Greek-speaking. What happened? Well, the story of Byzantium is one of tragedy and horror and disappointment, followed by amazing recovery. Within a hundred years of the establishment of Byzantine North Africa, Islam arose. And in, by 715, 720, all of North Africa was lost to the Byzantines. Most of middling Spain was lost. Egypt was lost. And so much so was the challenge from the new religion of Islam that in the 7th and 8th centuries, from the new focus of Islamic power in Egypt, there were direct attacks on Constantinople itself. Constantinople had, of course, magnificent walls. They were the greatest example of capital investment in the ancient world, huge. Huge circuit, huge height, huge breadth. And they had a magnificent fleet. And in a series of war, they stopped Islam literally right below the walls of Constantinople. We associate this amazing victory with Western technology, specifically Greek fire, this strange concoction of pressurized, flame-throwing uh, machines that could ignite an enemy's sails on their galleys and incinerate a fleet. And, and so Islam was not able to attack the core of the Byzantians. Byzantium then was able to spread and to at least solidify its holdings uh, in the Middle East and in Anatolia. And the next great challenge to it after the successful resistance to the Arab powers was a group of nomadic Islamic people, we call them the Seljuk Turks, that came from the area of modern-day Ankara. And by 1071, in the Great Battle of Manzikert, they defeated the Byzantines and carved off large sections of their empire. By the time of the First and Second Crusades, much of the Holy Land was lost to the Byzantines. The Fourth Crusade was very ironic because it was ostensibly a Byzantine call for help from the Western Roman Catholics, so to speak. And under the, fourth, the auspices of the Fourth Crusade, the Venetians and Franks came to Constantinople to mobilize an army and a joint force to go southward and to free up the Holy Land, and instead they sacked Constantinople. At that time, Constantinople was the wealthiest city, perhaps not only in what we would call the West, but in the world at large. And they so sacked Constantinople that it never really recovered. Three days of rape, pillage, and looting. All of the Byzantine Empire as we knew it in Greece was taken over by a combination of Venetian and Frankish kings. And at that point in the early 13th century AD, it looked like Byzantium would fall. And it did not. It recovered. It pushed out the Franks and the Venetians. It reestablished its defenses. And for another 250 years, it was able once again to keep Roman and Western civilization alive in a place that had been really an inhospitable. I mean inhospitable from the very beginning of the Roman Empire itself. They always had more problems in the East than they did in the West. And yet this outpost of Hellenism, of Greek-speaking, Greek culture under the auspices of the Roman Empire was able to survive until the final assault came in the 14th and 15th century by the successors to the Seljuk Turks, the Ottoman Turks. And that great siege that commenced in 1453 Constantinople fell, and it fell to a combination of Western-trained experts that were allowed uh, the Sultan's army to have magnificent cannon to sheer manpower.
There probably was not more than 8,000 defenders by 1453, and the city had shrunk from, one, from a population, perhaps in the 9th or 10th century AD of a million, down to 40 or 50,000. And yet it still held on for months. When it collapsed, then Western civilization in the East was essentially extinguished. And so today, whether we look at Iraq, or we look at Turkey, or we look at Lebanon, or we look at Syria, they are Islamic. If we look at Greece today, it's having difficulties, and part of the reasons it is not as dynamic as it was in antiquity, it was occupied for almost 400 years by the Ottoman Turks. And that was the end of uh, Western civilization in the East. Now, when we think of Byzantine, and we don't associate it with uh, calcified bureaucracy or an esoteric branch of Christianity, but we look at it at its own merits, what did it do for the West? Why was it so special? Why was May 29th of 1453, when the great church at Santa Sophia that Justinian had built, 20,000 people were in there when the doors broke open, and they were praying to the archangel Mark to deliver them, when, and they were butchered or enslaved. Why was that such a catastrophe for Western civilization? Well, the first thing to remember is that when the Western Empire fell in the 5th century AD, it didn't quite fall. The Goths, the Visigoths, even the Vandals earlier, they had all been, through a process of cultural osmosis, Christianized, and they started to inherit the legacy, the fumes, if you will, of Roman civilization in the West. And by the 8th century, we had what we call the Holy Roman Empire, and by the 9th and the 10th and 11th, we started to see the beginnings of what we would call the modern medieval nation state, whether it was France, or it was the Habsburgs, or it was uh, the kingdoms of Germany, or England. Why was that possible? That was possible because through this entire period, the Byzantines were a garrison state. They were fighting the Ottomans tooth and nail for much of the 12th, 13th, and 14th century. So when you see very successful cultures that were, we associate with the Renaissance, Florence, for example, or Venice, they were fighting in their immediate environs, but not all the way along the coast of Asia Minor. Byzantium, in other words, was holding Islam at bay for about four or five hundred years, and that gave a breathing space for the West. Without Byzantium, it's, uh, I think you could make the argument that the West would have fallen to Islam itself, and uh, maybe as early as the seventh or eighth or ninth century. Uh, there was a second great contribution of the Byzantines. And that was uh, artistic, cultural, literary. Remember, they were Greek speakers. It's true that Justinian spoke Latin, and some of the western parts of the Byzantine Empire were still Latin-speaking. But for the most part, by the 9th or 10th century AD, the Byzantine Empire was a Greek-speaking and largely Greek aristocracy that was running the empire. As many as 5 to 8 to 10 million people spread all the way from the northern Black Sea area down to Egypt at one point, and as I said, from the Tigris and Euphrates to the Adriatic Sea. This is important because Western Roman culture kept alive largely the Latin tradition. 11th and 12th century, people in the West had forgotten how to speak Greek, and they didn't read it very well. That was not true of Byzantium. Greek scholars, high officials of the Orthodox Church, and it was starting to become Orthodox and split clearly from Western Christianity, they kept alive textual traditions that go back to Thucydides, to Sophocles, to Homer, as well as the scientific treatises. So there was an entire body of knowledge that was not very well known to the West. When the Ottomans began to pressure the Byzantines in a serious fashion in the 13th century AD, and after the sack during the Fourth Crusade by Westerners, the West became aware of this Hellenic contribution, and as scholars began to flee or were taken captive or whatever the circumstances were, they began to arrive in places like Padua, Turin, and they began to enrich the classical tradition by adding a Greek element to it and bringing manuscripts that had not been known from the ancient world, the Greek world, beginning to teach Italian scholars Greek. And the result of that, they were a real catalyst for the renaissance of the late 14th century that blossoms into the 5th century. Without Byzantine culture, in other words, the legacy of classical Greece might have well been lost in, in large part. But remember, the people in the Western Renaissance were not just trying to be good Romans. They thought they were Greeks. 
And the reason they could think that, they had for the first time access to the Greek tradition and Greek texts and had started to learn Greek. And they were familiar with Hellenism thanks to Byzantine influence. There was a third reason that we should stop and pause and give the Byzantines their due. And that was India and China had been lucrative areas of trade for Westerners. And we know the silk routes, the long silk routes that came through Afghanistan, they came down through the old Persian Empire, and they came into outposts on the Black Sea. But Byzantium made sure that the Black Sea was a safe place to navigate and to have mercantile interest. And there were port cities throughout. So typically, when overland caravans arrived, the Byzantines would ensure safe passage into Constantinople, and then throughout the Mediterranean, Westerners would have access to everything from porcelain to pepper to silk and uh, exotic spices, all coming from the Far East. Without Byzantium, the West would not be able to have access to the great wealth of the Far East. And the proof is always in the pudding, because when Byzantium fell in 1453, that window on the Far East was gone. The Ottomans took over, and they were very different middlemen than the Greek-speaking Byzantines were. And the result was that almost immediately, 1453, 1492, you only have 40 years, people in the West said, this is an intolerable situation. We're becoming impoverished. We have our entire trade in the Eastern Mediterranean bifurcated. Uh, it's no longer a Western lake. We have to find another way to have access. And that really prompted the great seafaring efforts of Spain and England especially, but also Holland and France as a result of losing Constantinople as a window on the west. So what this appears from Procopius to Gibbon as a intricately Byzantine, a labyrinth of intrigue and out of date society was in fact not so at all. It kept Western civilization alive it kept Islam at bay. It kept a window uh, on Greek trade. And finally, why, why did it do all these things? What was, why were they able to do things that the West had not been able to do? One of the ideas uh, that scholars advance is it was a garrison state. From the very beginning, with the fall of the West in the fifth century, the Byzantines realized that they had no avenue for experimentation, so the church had a mission not just as a religious experience, but as a quasi-political entity in itself. And the reason that it was so successful is that it was able to convince people that they were Christian, they were Westerners, they were Hellenic speakers, and they had a unique culture. There was a sense of belonging to the Byzantines that had been much more solidified and strong than had been true of the Western Romans in the fourth and fifth century. It was Thanks to the Byzantines today, whether it's the Serbian Orthodox Church in the Balkans, or whether it's the Greek Orthodox Church in mainland Greece, whether it's the Russian Orthodox Church, whether it's the Armenian Orthodox Church, these all represent this attempt by Byzantium to extend the word of Christ and to create a civilization in a very inhospitable part of the world. They also had, for all the coups and all the revolutions and civil wars, we hear the Nika riots under the Emperor Justinian. There was more or less a stability in Constantinople. They were a very tolerant people. There were Venetians there. There were Jews there. There were Genoans there. There were Northern Europeans there. They brought in specialists. They brought in traders. They were metallurgists. There were scientists. It was a tolerant society. It had an effective bureaucracy. There was a consulting quasi-parliament. There was not necessarily hereditary succession to be the emperor of the Byzantines. It was often through a nephew or a cousin or from a completely different family. But they did not have the level of civil strife that had been true of Rome in the West from the first to the fourth century. So they had a certain stability. They had a certain faith in God that gave them a confidence. And they realized very early on that they were surrounded by Arabs. They were soon surrounded by Muslims. They were surrounded by Bulgars. They were surrounded by Huns. They were surrounded by Seljuk Turks. They were surrounded by Ottomans. And yet they kept Western civilization alive. Now, why today do we not, uh, do we not appreciate this legacy? As I said, it has something to do with the ancient tradition in Procopius. It has something to do with the more modern and Edward Gibbon. But there's also this sense 
that Greece is backward, the, the foundation of democracy. Why is it backward? Is it because of Byzantium? No, it's not. It's not because of orthodoxy. It's not because of its particular take on Western Christianity. It's because of the failure of Byzantium to survive. And I shouldn't use that failure at all, that term failure. It was the ability of Byzantium for a thousand years after the fall of civilization in the West to allow people to have that same experience in the East. And when it was extinguished, then the Ottomans began to cultivate, colonize, conquer, absorb the Eastern Mediterranean under very different auspices. So we should look at that dark day of May 29th, 1453, not just as a historical artifact, but a great tragedy for Western culture today. When minarets went on top of Santa Sophia, the greatest dome in the ancient world, the largest church in the ancient world, it represented uh, uh, the end, so to speak, of Western civilization in the East with all the calamity that would follow.